Uh, right, joining me to have a further look at today's papers is Sophia Warringer, researcher and political commentator with Young Voices UK. Good morning, Sophia. Good morning, James. Uh, let's begin with a story on the front of the Times, knockdown prices for Greenbelt to build on. Uh, this is the government's plan to... Um, well, basically make it easier for local councils to compulsorily purchase Greenbelt land to meet their housing target. Is the government right to be as radical as they seem like they're being on housing? And crucially, can they deliver? I think they are right to really have this ambitious plan for increasing the supply of housing in this country. And this is the time to do it because this is the beginning of the parliament. This is when political will is kind of at its highest behind the government plans. And this is the time where it'll have the most impact and time to kind of really embed. But it's going to be really difficult. And I think the green belt conversation is one of the stickiest parts of housing supply policy. And they've they've made the conversation move on by talking about the grey belt. Now, mm. some of those terms um, make it sound less a kind of affront to our what people think of as rolling hills and, and green hedgerows. And actually, a lot of the so-called green belt is actually uh, kind of partially developed land or there's been talk of uh, things that are categorised as the green belt and um, that are actually disused car parks or kind of uh, wasteland. And they absolutely should be re-categorised. And this term grey belt, therefore, kind of more accurately describes what those uh, land um, types are. But the problem is going to be when the, the grey belt becomes grey and it's not hard to find reasons why it will be uh, unclear which category land is coming in. And I do think um, because of that, it's, it's going to be very difficult. So the question of whether they deliver is, is yet to be seen. The targets are very ambitious. Um, so it will be difficult. Yeah, and crucially, whether they can deliver in time for the next election so the voters actually feel like there's been a difference in the price of housing and the affordability of it and the supply and all of that. And, you know, changing the planning system is one thing. A lot of people would say it's desperately needed. But there are other big questions as well about, you know, do we have enough tradespeople in order to build these houses? Do we have the builders? Do we have the planning inspectors to get all of this through? And actually, there's a lot of environmental regulation, for example. A lot of um, big developments are held up currently because of biodiversity legislation that may be well-intentioned, but ends up blocking development that can often be badly needed. And does the government have the, the gumption to, to rip some of that up? Yeah, I think poor newts always get a bad rep for holding up crucial development. <laughs> they do. And, it uh, is often the newt, isn't it? It is often the newt. So I'm sure the newt will have to be uh, a bit more uh, accommodating. But I think in terms of the skills uh, that we need, maybe that is something that is um, really lacking, but is also a huge opportunity. The government have said that they're going to try and go for growth and the house building programme is one of the key ways that they can deliver that promise to see um, productivity rise and upskilling people with this crucial um, skill set that can push through kind of more houses across the country is a key way to see economic inactivity decline, to see skills rise um, and particularly to see kind of regional um, inequalities in unemployment uh, be tackled as well. So I think there's, there's a really positive uh, story to be told there and a really uh, positive way of making those two big policy questions of growth and house building move together. But I think it's um, going to be very difficult, particularly when you talk about things like compulsory purchase orders. And I feel mm. uneasy about things like that being relied on too much. I do think people's right to own property and the government's right to not you know, ride roughshod over that is a very central tenet of how this country works. And if people always feel like, well, ultimately the government can come and snatch away your property and a kind of cost price um, offer with no means of pushing back on that, I think it will cause a lot of ill will. But if, if developers are doing what's known as land banking, they're just sitting on land and not, develop, not developing it for years, I mean, doesn't the government have a role for the greater good to address the wider housing crisis, to come in and, and, and buy it off them? Yeah, so land banking is a huge problem. And I think part of the reason why people feel like they can do that is because they think that the price of the land will always increase because they think that house prices will always increase at a kind of very constant rate. But if there is this kind of systematic approach of increasing the supply of land and this kind of exponential increase, which has been causing so many of the issues, and um, will hopefully start to taper off. And that will mean that people uh, can can kind of hedge their bets less 
uh, confidently on the future price of that land. And also um, in that is certainty. And one of the reasons why developers have been so reluctant uh, to relinquish their land or, you know, to sell it on, in, in fact, is because they think that they will always get a better price because the policy landscape is constantly shifting and they'll get an agreement for one type of development, but then that will be rode back on because mm. there will be a different policy in place. So the fact that there hopefully will be certainty for, you know, at least five years will mean that that, uh, some of that uncertainty will be removed and hopefully people can move forward confidently. Now, thankfully, the worst of the riots appear to have died down. Hopefully they don't flare up again. On the front of the Telegraph this morning, Yvette Cooper says the UK has lost respect for the police. Is that right? I don't think so. I still think that the m people who have come out violently against the police are the minority and I think the majority of the country still respect the job the police do, understand that it is difficult and are grateful um, for the security they bring to their communities. But this is a very strange situation where the Home Secretary, Labour Home Secretary, of course, is accusing a previous government, which was Conservative, of being soft on crime. And that does feel like a bit of a switch to where mm. classically those um, parties have stood on crime policy. Um, but I think also really important that the government are equally condemning all types of violence and they're not just honing in on something that feels politically expedient to them and kind of ignoring other protests which we've had recently that have been violent, that have had less outrage attached to them. Yeah, I mean, she says in a piece for The Telegraph that, that many people feel as if crime has no consequences. I mean, I suppose there is a genuine concern that some people have that, that certain types of crime haven't been policed very much in recent years. Shoplifting is a good example. Burglaries, a lo lot of forces have just downgraded the priority they put on burglaries, for instance. And for a lot of people, you know, there is, there is almost nothing worse than, than for your house to be invaded, essentially, and burgled is a really awful thing. And, and, and some people have concerns that the police have downgraded certain crimes. Yeah, but I think some of that is not helped by the fact that how rapid some of this sentencing and uh, court appearances have been for the rioters. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but when you compare it to other crimes where people have been waiting for sometimes years to see their perpetrator gone through the courts and yet now you have these people already being sentenced and starting to serve their jail terms, it does feel a little bit kind of like there are some things that are a priority over others. Mm. And what's really important is how people feel actually over the country and most types of crime, it has started to go down and has continued to go down for quite a long time. But the perception of being unsafe has risen and people feel unsafe and they feel, as you said, that those crimes that really matter to them that are close to their homes, like things like burglaries or, sh or shoplifting or, you know, car break-ins, yeah. the, the police are not interested in. And you know that is resource and I'm not saying that's necessarily the police's fault. There's lots of pressures on their time. But what is really important is people feel safe and unfortunately a lot of the time they don't. Right, we've got time for one more story, Sophia. Your choice. Do you want to talk about the Olympics or Banksy? Always the Olympics. <laughs> I absolutely love the Olympics. Well, do you think the Parisians pulled it off? I do. And, uh, you know, that hurts me because I do think 2012 was still uh, a kind of pinnacle of Olympics. And it wasn't as good as 2012, but it was just, no. it was very good in its own way. It was good. And I think also we went in with low expectations because the beginning was beset by train delays and that kind of systematic attack on transport network, mm. which made you think that the rest of the games would be really beheld by problems. But actually after that, it was smooth. Um, and I think a lot of the athletes, the British athletes have said how grateful they are that the crowds are back after Tokyo and how that has made a difference and also how close to home it's been. So, so many friends and family can come and cheer them along and how much that's made a big difference to their experience of the Games. And yeah, it's just a fantastic event, isn't it? Um, there's nothing quite like it bringing it, people together. Yeah, it's a great piece by Adam Sage, uh, Paris correspondent in The Times today, saying that going into the Games, there was a bit of doom and gloom, a lot of scepticism about it in France, uh, but they've been completely won over and there's a, a feeling of joie de vivre in the country, which is great to hear about. Uh, Sophia, always a pleasure. Thank Thank you so much. Thanks, James. That's Sophia Warringer there, researcher and political commentator with Young Voices UK.